thank you for choosing today to join in with and to hear what God has put upon my heart for me to share and to say today. I want to thank you for, for, for listening and, and for tuning in. I want to start today with just opening up in a word of prayer. So, Father, I just thank you for this opportunity. I thank you, Lord, right now that you have placed a, a word in my heart, that you've given me revelation of what I need to say, and, and I thank you for it. Holy Spirit, come have your way and do what you need to do with this message. T talk to people, speak to people, and, and awaken within people what you need to do and what you alone can do. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Well, as I was studying the other day, I came across this story, and it's, it's the story of the disciples that are out in the boat. We all know this story from Sunday school age, where the disciples, they go out into the boat, and they're, they're fishing, but they catch nothing all night. And then Jesus comes, and he shows up, and he fills their net with fish, and it turns everything around. And as I was reading this story, I began to see it differently. And it reminds me of, like, this is where we are right now. E everything has slowed. Everything's at a, at a different pace. A and right now, we have time to look at things differently, time to appreciate things, time to take things in. A and this is the way it is with this story. Do you know, normally we just, we just take things for face value. You, you hear the story, the disciples, they're, they're on the boat. They're out fishing. Je they, they can't catch any fish. Jesus comes. He does a miracle. A and we, we listen to that story. We teach it to the kids and we think it's awesome. But then there's times where we need to take the word and we need to actually delve into it and, and look at the situation, the scenario, the season that they're in, the, the times that they're facing. And as I was reading through the story, I was struck by the difference of how I actually seen this. And I was struck by the thinking that, you know, this story was just, they were out in the boat fishing just after what happened to Jesus on the cross. That means that their best friend, their leader, they're the, the guy that they loved, they relied on, they followed, they needed, he was gone. They were distraught, they were, they were disappointed, they were discouraged, and everything that they had knew up to this point was now different. Nothing around them any longer looked the same. Let's read the scriptures. It's in Psalm tw sorry, John 21. Later, Jesus appeared again to the disciples beside the Sea of Galilee, and this is how it happened. Several of the disciples were there, Simon Peter, Thomas, nicknamed the twin, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples. And Simon Peter said, I'm going fishing. Well, we'll come too, they all said. So they went out in the boat, and they caught nothing all night. At dawn, Jesus was standing on the beach, but the disciples couldn't see who he was. He called out, fellas, have you got any fish? No, they replied. They said, he said, throw out your net to the other side of the boat and you'll get some. They did and they couldn't haul in the net because there were so many fish in it. Then the disciple that Jesus loved said to Peter, it's the Lord. And when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his tunic for he had stripped for work and he jumped into the water and he headed to shore. Let me paint the picture for you. The disciples up to this point, Jesus is gone. They're sitting in the room. It's, it's, it's the room where they would have met with Jesus, fellowshiped with Jesus, where they had supper with Jesus and, and he told them secrets and, they, and they, they relayed the situations and the memories and the marvelous things that they had been and seen through that day. And here they are in the room and there's silence because Jesus is gone. They're distraught, they're, they're disappointed, they're discouraged. You know, Jesus walked into their life one day when they were out fishing at sea, just doing the norm, getting on with life, and in walked Jesus, and he called them by name. They dropped everything to follow him and find everything they ever needed in him. And now he was gone. Now he's, now he's, he's not there when, when they need him to just call upon, to knock on his door, to, to see where he is. He's, he's disappeared, he's gone, he's not with them anymore and they're distraught, they're disappointed, the, the dream, the vision, life as they knew it, it's different. And then, and then Judas, he was one of them. He was, he was, he was their friend, he was the buddy, he was, he was one of the gang. And he just betrayed Jesus, which means he betrayed them. And now Judas is dead. 
just a couple of weeks ago, e e everything was normal, everything was great. They're walking through the town of Jerusalem. People are shouting Hosanna to the king, to their leader, Jesus. And now they've watched as they brutally crucified him on the cross, cheering and chanting. And now were those people that did that to Jesus going to want to come and get them? They were full of guilt and shame because on the night before Jesus went to the cross, he asked them, stay awake with me and pray. But they couldn't stay awake and they slept. They disappointed him. They let him die and they felt like, like, like on their last chance with him, they let him down. And then there's Peter. Jesus told him, you'll deny me three times. And Peter said, no, Jesus, I will never let you down. And as the rooster crowed the third time, he looked to the cross and his eyes met with Jesus. And he realized, I denied him. And now Jesus is gone. There's no chance to make it right. There's, uh, there's no way to just tell him, I'm, I, I'm sorry, I, I didn't mean to you. Forgive me with questions and there's no way to get the answers. Their hope is gone. Their strength is gone. There's no motivation, no purpose, no reason. Everything, life as they knew it, was now different. The normal had disappeared. And Peter, in the room, he looks to the guys and he says, Do you know what? I'm going fishing. In other words, he was saying, I'm going back to what I knew. I'm going back to, to what was normal to me before all of this. I'm just going to go and do what I used to do. I'm, I'm going back. And when he said, I'm going fishing, the other guy said, well, do you know what, Peter? We'll go too. Do you know, Peter didn't see, see he didn't realize that he was a leader. He made a suggestion and everybody else willingly and wanted to decided, yeah, we'll go too. But he was too broken to see the purpose that was on the inside of him. So they got themselves together. They got all the gear. They got to the boat. They took it out to sea and they fished all night. But they caught nothing. Why was it not working? Why was everything going wrong? I mean, we were, we were fishermen that knew how to do this. This, is, this used to be our trade. This is, this is what we were good at. And, and, and now we're returning to what we were good at once before. And now it's not working. And they're just deflated. They're physically, emotionally, mentally, and spiritually drained. Nothing seems to work. When's the breakthrough going to come? Where did it all go wrong? And now they're sitting on the boat and they're feeling like it's just easier to quit. When along comes a man on the beach, that man is Jesus. But they didn't recognize it was Jesus and, and why would they? Because they witnessed him on, on the cross and he'd, he, he'd gone to heaven to sit with the Father. So why would they recognize that it was Jesus? They don't have a Bible like we do that tells us what happens next. They were living in the now of not knowing what we now know. And they were so scared, full of fear, full of panic, totally deflated, distraught and discouraged, full of shame and guilt. And to add to it, going back didn't even work. And this man comes on the beach and he cites to them, hey guys, fellas, did you catch any fish? And they said, no. And he asks again, well, why don't you th take your net and throw it out the right hand side of the boat. And then you'll catch some. And I can see them on the boat looking at each other as if to say, who's this guy? Doesn't he know that 
We're, 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 we're fishermen. That's, that's what we did by trade. We, we used to make a living doing this stuff. Here, do you not think that we've tried throwing the net to the right, to the left, to the back, to the front? Do you not think we've tried everything that we know how to do, but it's just not working? And Jesus says to them, take your net and throw it out the right hand side of the boat and then you'll catch some. They've nothing to lose. So they decide to pick up the net and throw it out the right hand side. And I can hear them on the boat about to say, see mister, I told you it doesn't work. And just before they get to finish the sentence, the net starts to tug. The boat starts to rock. The boat is getting so heavy that it's starting to move. And, and, the, and these men, these men that, that were so deflated, no motivation, feeling of no purpose, thinking that life was a lot easier as it was before and now they're sitting in a place of no strength. They're now on their feet because the net is full, because things are changing, something's turning, breakthrough's coming. They're now at the place where they're lifting the net and they're hauling it in. And we know now from looking at the Bible and reading the passage of scripture that there was 153 and it says big fish on that net. And they're pulling that net and they're pulling that net, careful not to rip it, to not to lose one, but they're pulling it in to the boat. And what amazes me in the scripture is Peter. Remember, Peter's the one who said, he made the suggestion, let's go fishing. Let's go back. He, 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 he's the one who wanted to go and do what they used to do. And now here he is in the boat. I mean, I, I'm no fisherman, but I'm pretty confident that when you're out in a boat and you've caught a fish, it feels good. I, I'm pretty sure that, that when you catch that fish, that you want to bring it home to show your buddies. And now here they are in the boat and the biggest miracle happens. They throw out their net and 153 big fish are swimming in it. They're caught. And I think that's a moment where you, where you would want to get out the camera and video every minute of it so you can take it back to show the guys at the harbor the proof of what you've just completed. But where's Peter? He's not looking at the net, counting the fish. He's not even helping his friends to pull it in. He's not interested in what any of that is about. Because he has just realized that on that shore stands my master. He's not interested about the, 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 the moment of capturing this best thing ever. He's not, he's not interested. He's not even being distracted or sidetracked. And in fact, this guy who has went from no motivation of giving up on all he knew to go back to what it was before, this guy who was just full of no desire, no hope, no way, he now can't even wait for the boat to be pulled into shore. He can't even wait to help his friends to get them in. He has literally got himself all kitted up and he's jumped into the sea and he sh swam to shore. Such was the energy, motivation, and strength within this guy. Such was the hope that was in him because everything else around here just didn't matter because right in front of him stood the master. Do you know Jesus could have shown up that day in any other way? He could have walked onto the beach and he could have shouted, Hey guys, it's me, it's Jesus. I'm alive, I'm back. And that would have caught their attention. But Jesus didn't choose to just catch their attention. He chose to fill the net. Well, why did, why did he do it that way? Because he wanted to give them hope. He wanted to fill them with so much hope to let them see that hope hasn't died. It's not over. It's not finished. And then he wanted to show them that you don't need to go back to where you were for this to work. You don't need to turn. You don't need to go back to the norm. You don't need to, to look back. You don't need to want to go back to where it once worked. You just need to keep your eyes on me. 
You just need to listen for my voice. You, you just need to obey when I call. And I will show you, like I did with these fish, that I will make it happen for you way better over here than anything you ever had over here. And I love it. I love the change that it made. You know, that day changed everything for the disciples. That's the last time we heard of them ever going out to be fishermen again. Why? Because they became so full of the Holy Spirit that they had no time to be distracted, to even want to, or to even think about going back to the way it used to be, to going back to how things were, or to go back to doing the norm. They were so full of the Holy Spirit that every day they didn't have time for anything else but to wake up, get up, look alive, and be ready for what God had for them. For every day with the Holy Spirit was filled with purpose for living. And you know, I, I just want to stop there a second to just, just say something. If you do not know the Holy Spirit, if you do not fellowship with the Holy Spirit or, or welcome him into your daily lives, you are missing out big time. The Holy Spirit was sent by Jesus himself because he said, it is better for me to go so that I can send the one who will help you to do what I do and more in this lifetime. You know, that's a pretty big thing for Jesus to say because he was 100% marvelous. And yet he said, with the one he sends, we can do what he did and more. That's the Holy Spirit. That's the Holy Spirit. That's the one that, that, that when you invite him in into your life, he answers everything that you need. He is the comforter. He is your secret place. He is your refuge. He is your best friend. He is, he is your direction. He's your advisory. He is, he's everything. I just want to take this moment today to, set, to tell you, if you do not have this fellowship with the Holy Spirit, then please, please, Invite him in. And if you have come from a place up to this point where you attend, where the Holy Spirit is not welcome, then I just want to say in this moment, don't sit. Don't sit where the Holy Spirit has to be boxed in. Don't sit where the Holy Spirit has to watch what's happening on the other side of the door of the church because the Holy Spirit is what makes all of this come together. I love it. Everything about their day just changed the minute Jesus walked in. And you know, it's like where we are right now. We've, we've never lived in a time where life looks like how it looks right now. Do you know, my parents literally live right around the corner. And I can't even call into their house for a cup of tea. Churches are closed. The school doors are closed. Airports are closed. Those ever booming holiday destinations are empty. The beaches where at this time of the year right now would be heaving are silent. Everything is at a still. Everything no longer looks like how we knew it to be normal. And we don't know how long it will last. We don't know how long it's going to stay this way or how long it will take before it changes. But you know what we do? have a choice. We have a choice right now to want to go back to how it was before COVID-19 came. Or we have a choice to want to look this direction and keep our eyes focused on what God's bringing, new beginnings. You see, the story of the disciples on the boat that night, it reminds me of like the Israelites and since lockdown came, I have been studying right back to the start of the Bible, right back to Genesis and, Genesis and working my way through and doing a study and asking God to sh show me things like I've never seen before. Give me fresh revelation and show me what you need me to see. And I've been reading back and reading back through it. And as I'm reading back through it, through it I, I, I'm seeing a pattern of something. I realize something from Genesis 3 that the Israelites... They are not easy people. I would not fancy leading these guys. These, the, these guys are good when it's good, but they get bad 
when it's bad. To, the, to them, when it's good, God's good. But when it doesn't go their way, they turn on him. They're people that, that are not easily pleased. And thanksgiving is certainly not their heartbeat. Let me paint the picture. We've got the disciples, sorry, we've got the Israelites and they're living in Egypt. Egypt is, is, is controlled by Pharaoh. Pharaoh loves the control. He loves being the big shot. He loves that, he, that he's got the all power and the all answer for everybody. He loves that the Israelites are his little people. He loves that they're his slaves. He loves that he can beat them and torture them and abuse them and, 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 and he can do whatever he wants and they have to and must obey. And here they are and they're in Egypt and, and Pharaoh's given them demands that, 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 that they aren't even normal. Quotas to build the bricks, but no straw. They have to find the straw and make the bricks and build what he needs built with a certain demand for the day. And if you don't complete that quota, he can decide to take your food, to take your wages, or to do whatever he wants to do. Basically, he owns you. You have no freedom. And the Israelites, they're out in the field and they're crying out to God and they're, God, we can't take this anymore. Why, 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 why is, this is not how life was meant to be. It was not meant to go this way. It was not meant to turn out this way. And yet here we are and we're tortured and life just seems too difficult. Life just seems too hard. And I can't do this anymore. And they're crying out, God, would you just save us? And God hears their cries. And he answers he gets straight onto it with a plan of action and he sends Pharaoh, and, sorry, he sends Moses and he sends Aaron and he sends them to meet Pharaoh and they lead the Israelites out of Egypt. You know, these guys, they got to know what it was to stand as God took everything from the Egyptians and all the while protected everything of theirs. They stood 10 times as God sent plague after plague after plague after plague to their doors. Taking from them, killing their livestock, stealing their comfort, taking the water, taking the, 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 sim the simplicity of, of the luxuries of life for them. And yet over here, everything the Israelites had, God protected. They didn't even lose so much as a lamb not a loved one lost, not, no, no one hurt, not so much as a locust or a frog in the bed. And God protected them all. These are the people that, 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 that walked right up to the Red Sea. And, and here comes Pharaoh and Pharaoh's coming behind them. And, and, and he's cheering and he's angry because Pharaoh made a wrong decision and Pharaoh doesn't like it when Pharaoh gets it wrong. So Pharaoh's coming up and there's chariots behind him and there's hordes of people and they're angry and they're whipping and they're screaming, we're coming for you. And they're angry and they're chasing them and the Israelites are terrified and they're standing at the Red Sea because never before has the Red Sea ever parted. So here they are at a dead end. Life as they knew it was over. God had taken them from Egypt and now here they stood at the Red Sea and what looked impossible, God made a way. He parted the sea down the middle and with the wind of the waves, with the roar of the waves at either side, they walked right through. And as they made it out the other side, if that wasn't good enough, when they reached safety of the other side of the sea, as Pharaoh came on the water to catch them, God shut the waters on him and silenced the threat of the enemy forever. He took away the threat for the Israelites of Pharaoh ever deciding to come after them and capture them and take them. And oh, they loved God that day. They cheered and they jo joked and they danced and they laughed and they worshipped and they made up songs and they loved him until they got hungry. And God sent the manna. But the manna, it didn't look the same as what they were used to. It didn't taste the same as what they were used to. It didn't even feel the same as they were used to and it didn't come in the way that they were used to dinner being served. And so they turned on him 
And they turned to Moses and they said, Moses, why did God bring us here that we would die? Why didn't he just leave us in Israel, in Egypt, where it was, where it was okay? Are you kidding me? Are you for real? Because when back in Egypt, Pharaoh, he abused and laughed and mocked and ridiculed you. He treated you like you were nothing compared to him but a bit of dirt on the end of his shoe. He treated you with, 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 with work that you could not possibly and physically do or complete. A and you look at your kids and you know that one day they're going to grow up to be under the same labor that you're trying to complete. And God heard your cry and he freed you. And now you want to go back. Remember the reason God saved you was because he heard your cry. You see all too well, when we get taken and are in an unknown situation, a situation where we're not comfortable, we can choose to want to run back and generally in life, that's how it goes. When we're in pain or fear or discouragement or, or anything like that, we can choose to run and, and run back to what, what once felt like it might not be right. It might, it might not be good. It might not be the right thing for us, but it's more comfortable because it's known. And it's the wrong one. They wanted to go back to Egypt, to where it was horrible, to where they cried out to God for God to take them from just because it was what they were used to. It was where it was more comfortable. It's where they were the norm. And now here they are asking God, would you, would you just take us? Would have been better off, Lord, if you had a just left us there. And here we are in a wilderness situation. And it's like exactly where the Israelites were. And we find ourselves here where Pastors and preachers are, are, are having to speak to a camera instead of a congregation. Where our prayer meetings are in our homes, in the privacy of our rooms instead of with other people. Nothing looks like how it used to. Everything looks different. But let me tell you this. Different does not mean that it's over. Different does not mean that it's time to quit. Different does not mean it's time to sit down and wait till this passes to see what to do. No. Different means it's time to get prepared for the new beginnings that's coming. And as I was studying during the week, you know, God gave me this awesome scripture. Do you know as a church, every night at 7 p.m. since this COVID-19 pandemic has came, we have all met in our own homes separately, praying for whatever it is that the pastor has asked us that night to pray for. And he meets with, with God and, he, and God shows him every single night the request of what it is that we must pray for. A and I can tell you that even though we're not meeting physically here in the congregation together, we are praying hard and long for God to come and meet us, to meet the needs and answer the cries for what's happening, for we don't want to hear of another person suffering. We don't want to hear of another loved one being taken in the hospital. We don't, we don't want to hear of another family that's having to say goodbye to a loved one. We don't want to hear of, a, of another business door that's having to close and it won't reopen. We, 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 don't, we don't like hearing of our NHS staff and our frontline workers who are exhausted and worn out and trained. We don't like all this. We don't want all this. But we do know something in all of this. That God always turns everything around for our good. What the enemy meant for evil God turns it for our good. Amen. And when he thought closing the church doors was going to stop the church, what the enemy didn't realize was that church isn't about the building, so the church has just got stronger. What the enemy didn't realize was when he thought that closing down the countries would silence everybody, he didn't reckon that there was going to be videos spread across social media of countries that were on their knees waving flags and worshiping Jesus. 
when the enemy thought that COVID-19 would cause such a mess that he would win, he forgot what the end of the story said, that God has already won. He cannot win what is already won. You see, even though it's, it's not a nice situation, and it's not, it's sorrowful and it's horrible for many, many families. We need to remember in this situation right now what is the most important. And the most important for each of us right now is to be in his presence. Nothing else should take precedence or preference. It's all about his presence. The scripture that he gave me was in Isaiah 56. I'll read it first of all in the, in, the, in the King James Version. Isaiah 56, and it says, Thus saith the Lord, Keep ye judgment and do justice, for my salvation is near to come and my righteousness to be revealed. Now let me read it to you from the message version of the Bible. It says, God's message Guard my common good and do what is right and do it in the right way. For my salvation is just around the corner. My setting things right is about to go into action. Do you ever have one of those revelations, one of those, one of those times when God comes and he says something or he shows you something and, and you just feel it right from the feet down deep, right up inside like a joy that's spilling over that you can't contain it, that you have to do a wee dancey jig around the living room because you're just so bubbled up with enthusiasm and expectation that God has spoken truth and that God is going to come and do what he has said. God's message Guard, if here is a word for you today, guard my common good. Do what is right and do it in the right way. For my salvation is just around the corner. My setting things right is about to go into action. Oh, what an awesome scripture. You, you can't argue with that scripture. Some people might try to, but the truth is you can't argue with that. God is saying that right now, if we do what is right, and we do it in the right way, meaning obeying him and listening to him right back from the start of what he commanded way before our time back to Moses when he commanded all of those commandments. Right back to all his works right through what he has commanded for us to do. When we guard what is right and we do what is right in the right way, God is saying, my salvation is just around the corner and my setting things right is about to go into action. What a glorious answer for today. What a marvelous, marvelous answer that God has brought to us. You see, how many of us are crying out for loved ones to come, to come back to the Lord? Before COVID-19 was even heard of, before any of this, how many of you were crying out for a loved one to, 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 to surrender their life to Jesus? I have. I have lots of brothers, lots of sisters, lots of in-laws, lots of families, lots of friends that do not know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. But in this, in this pandemic, more than ever, God is making a way for our loved ones to see him clearly. Hearts are being softened. Lives are being turned around. Eyes are being opened. Ears are being opened. Hearts are being softened towards knowing who he is so that they will come to know God. It's awesome. It's exciting. It, it, it is. It's, it's exciting times that we're living in. You know, this is the time where we're going to see loved ones come into the church, fill, fill in the church. This is, this is the time where we're going to see the church of God filling up. This is the time where miracles, signs, and wonders are going to be spread across the land like never before. There is exciting days ahead, people. Exciting days. When Peter sat on that boat that day, he thought it was all over. Life as he knew it was over. And so it was. Life was never going back to the way Peter and the disciples knew it. Jesus wasn't coming back to walk earth the way he did. Life was different. God didn't take Peter and take him back to normal. God brought him forward into something brand new. 
And what Peter didn't realize at that point, that life for Peter was just a bite to take off. It was just a bite to get good. And we see this because we read in the word in Acts 5, 15. Acts 5 and 15, it says, as a result of the apostles' work, sick people were brought out into the streets on beds and mats so that Peter's shadow might fall across some of them as he went by. His shadow. So people that were sick and lame and hurt and in need of a miracle, they would take them on their beds and they would take them on the mats and they would carry them down the stairs and they would put them out on the street and they would leave them there in hope that when Peter would walk by, not even to touch his hand, not even to get him to talk to you, not even to lay his hand on you, but literally for his shadow to walk down the street past was enough for these people to be made healed and whole. The Peter that denied Jesus on the cross, yes. The Peter that decided to give it all up and go back to the way life used to be, yes. The Peter that sat on the boat and, uh, uh, and didn't even recognize that it was the master at the shore? Yes. The Peter that sat on the boat that all dreams and, uh, and vision and, uh, and purpose and everything that he knew was, was gone? The Peter that had given up? That, that Peter? Yes. That Peter. That Peter was now Peter that walked the streets and if his shadow touched the people, he would be made, they would be made whole. Remember what Jesus said, it is better that I go so that I can send the one to you so that th with him you can do what I did upon earth and more. And now Peter's doing it. Peter's walking down the street. People are moving in his shadow and just by being in the shadow of Peter, people are healed. People were healed. I would guess that if that day Peter knew before he left that room to go fishing, what life was actually got planning right in front of him, he wouldn't have got on that boat. He wouldn't have bothered to go fishing because life for Peter, it did look different. He wasn't going back to the norm. Life for Peter was only just beginning. It was about to get real good. So what are you praying for? What are, you, what are you asking for God right now? Why would you pray to ask God to take us back to the norm? Why would you ask God to, to lift COVID-19 so we can go back to church as it was and, uh, and go back to life as it was and go back to the, the situations that the way they were? Why, why would we ask that? Why would we want to go back to normal? Why? The normal where the churches weren't full. The normal were Sunday nights were practically empty. The, the Sunday nights were, 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 were churches all across the globe were having to close down Sunday night services because they couldn't get the people to come to fill the church. The normal were the prayer meeting all across the globe was the least attended meeting in the church. The normal were suicide rating was at its highest. The normal were mental health was at its peak. The normal where abortion laws were being passed. The normal where, where dr dr drinks, drink was not enough anymore, but the youth of our day are, are now heading out towards the drugs because it's a, it's a better high. The norm where the fear of the Lord is no longer preached, talked about, or even thought about in the churches. Why would we want to go back to the way it was. Why would we want to go back to what we prayed for God to take us from? We've asked him to fill the church. We've asked him to bring in the unsaved. We've asked him for our loved ones to come to know him. We've asked him for revival. We've asked him for breakouts of, 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 of his glory across the land. We've, we've cried and we've asked him and now he's taken us out, using the mess of the enemy to bring about his glory. 
Why would we ask to go back? Now is not the time to give up. It's not, now is not the time to quit. It's not the time to complain. It's, it's not the time to sit back and wait to see how this whole thing palms out before we decide to make decisions or decide to step up or decide to step out. No, now is, now is the time more than ever before to get closer to, the, to God, more than you ever have been. Now is the time for, for you to find out what he wants to say to you. It's the time where you want to be awakened to who you are. Do you know, this is honestly the cry of my heart to God. Every single day I ask him, God, would you awaken me to who you are? Awaken me to who you see me as, who I am. Awaken me, God, to the call that is on my life that you have put specifically on the inside of me to reach those that you have set out for me. Would you just awaken me to it all, God? And when you pray that and you ask God every day that he would awaken you, I can promise you, God will awaken you to it like never before. And it becomes the most exciting life you could ever live. You know, I've heard many preachers saying, and I agree that this is not the end. This is not the end. And I agree even more when they say that this is a wake-up call. This is a wake-up call if ever the world needed a wake-up call. So let me ask you this. If it's a wake-up call, are you awake? Are you awake to God? Have you fallen away from him? Have you, have you, been, have you backslidden? Have you, ha, ha, have you just forgotten about spending time with him because life got real busy? Have you, have, have you forgotten to put him first? Were you disappointed? Were you discouraged? Were you let down? Were you disheartened? Were you grieved and broken? Now's the time to make it right with God and let him take you back to where it's just about you and him and let him build you from there you see right back at the start of this 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 story when we read about peter and his disciples you know they're on the boat and they're full of fear and panic and anxiety and worry and stress and discouragement and and and, and dis- disappointment and, and shame and guilt and all of this is going on inside that little boat and all it took was jesus to walk onto the beach. All it took was Jesus to make the situation different. All it took was for, 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 for them to look towards him, listen for him, and be obedient to what he asked. And when they did that, life turned around. You see, Jesus was always there. He was always on the shore while, they, while, they, while he was asking to throw in the net and to do those things. Jesus was there, but they just didn't recognize him. Jesus was there the first time when they asked him to throw in the net and they, and they said, no, we've tried it. But it didn't work because they didn't listen to him. But when they chose to listen and be obedient to what God had asked them to do, look what happened. Jesus spoke. They obeyed, and a miracle happened. Their life that was over as they knew it really just started to begin. Life's not over. Life is not over for you. This is not it finished. It is not time to quit. It is not time to give up. It is not time to sit down. It is not time to let somebody else do it. It is not time for you to live off someone else's prayers. It is not time for you to live off someone else's connection with God. It is time for you to find a connection with God. It is time for you to come to know him as your personal Lord and Savior of your life because I can guarantee you when you do that, you will never regret the day you made that decision. It will become the best decision you have ever made in your life. Oh, yes, it will. To wrap this up, I encourage you today. Let's not pray to ask God to take us back. And let's not be like the Israelites that in the wilderness and in the time of unknown and in the time of waiting that we, that we get 
full of complaining. Where's your breakthrough, God? I don't see you. What are you doing? Oh, why is this happening? Why are you not lifting it? Why are you not? And instead of complaining, just trusting. Trusting that what God sees for out the other side is way better than where we were before this happened. God is on the move. God is in control. And God is going to do something out the other side of this that is going to shake to the core the body of Christ that we are wakened to a new day of new beginnings where God is going to move. This is not a time to quit, not a time to stop, not a time to sit down, but this is time to look alive and be prepared for what God is about to do. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for, thank you for listening and thank you for, 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 for just spending time to hear what God has had to say. I just want to pray as a finish and thank you once again. Father, I just thank you for absolutely all of who you are. I thank you, Father God, for everything you have ever planned and created. I thank you that you do see the big, bigger picture. You see it from all avenues. You see it from all areas. You know what is best for us, Father. And I know, God, that without a shadow of a doubt, we are about to enter in to the best times of our lives. New beginnings, salvation just around the corner, our loved ones bowing their knee to you, Father God, after such a time of being stubborn and hard-hearted and deciding I'm not going and not wanting to listen to you, now is the time, God, when they'll bow the knee and give life totally over to you. I thank you, God, for what you're doing in the midst of the chaos. I thank you for what you're doing amidst the heartache. I thank you for what you're doing and amidst the grief and the, and, the, and, the, and the freak outs from people. But I thank you, God, that you are pushing all of that to the side and you are making room for new beginnings. I thank you, God, today for what you are doing across the globe, what you are on the move doing. I thank you that you have already stepped into action and you are about to bring times of refreshing, times of encouragement. You are going to bring, Father God, showers of blessings upon us. And I thank you for your word that mightily brings light to us amongst these times. I thank you, God, for who you are and what you're doing. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Thank you again for tuning in and, and we look forward to seeing you back at 11 o'clock on Sunday morning as Pastor Joe is back giving his word. Thank you again. Amen. Amen.